Hi guys. So today we are going to talk about chapter six, which is the integumentary system. So first off to explain what an organ is, an organ is two or more types of tissue that are grouped together to perform a specific function. So the skin is actually the largest organ we have in our body. Skin is also referred to as a cutaneous membrane. It is composed of several tissue types, but the epithelial tissue on top remember it doesn't have any blood vessel innervation so it has to have connective tissue underneath it to nourish it so the outer layer is called the epidermis and the deeper layer of connective tissue is called the dermis but the integumentary system is made up of more than just the skin there are also accessory structures involved so that includes the glands the sensory receptors the hair and the nails so the outer layer of the skin is the epidermis it is made up of stratified squamous epithelium, as you can see in the picture over there. Remember, epithelial tissue has a basement membrane that connects to it. So the basement membrane is going to be between the epidermis and the dermis. The dermis is going to be made up of dense, irregular connective tissue. And it is the thicker of the two layers. It has a lot of collagen and elastic fibers as well. And then there's another layer underneath it, which technically isn't considered to be part of the skin, but it provides insulation. And it's called the subcutaneous layer or the hypodermis. As I said, it is insulating and it is beneath the dermis. It is made up of areolar and adipose connective tissue. So here's a picture of the skin with everything labeled. You can see the yellow bottom layer is that subcutaneous layer of adipose tissue. That's going to provide insulation so we don't get as cold. Then you have the dermis, which is the bulk of that picture. And then the epidermis is the top layer. Notice the blood vessel innervation in the dermis is what's actually nourishing the epidermis. So the epidermis is made up of stratified squamous epithelium, as I said. It lacks blood vessels, so it gets its nourishment from the dermis beneath it. The deepest layer is called the stratum basale, and this is where the stem cells are. So that is the actively dividing layer. As the cells divide, they get pushed up towards the surface. And as they get pushed up towards the surface, they're moving away from the nutrient supply of the dermis. So what happens is they start to disintegrate and actually start to die. So as they migrate, they begin to flatten out to where the top layer is actually just dead skin cells. Keratinization is the process of dehydration, hardening, and keratin accumulation that happens in the epidermal cells as they migrate outward. Keratin itself is a waterproof protein that is made by the cells and stored in the cells. It is very tough and fibrous. As the cells migrate outwards and reach the outer surface, they become tightly packed and actually develop desmosomes, which remember desmosomes are those spot welds or rivets that kind of anchor the skin but give it some pull. And these form the outer layer, which is called the stratum corneum. Those are the cells that are eventually shed from the skin surface. Now there's two different types of skin. There's thick skin and thin skin. Thin skin is on most of the body, but our palms and the soles of our feet have what is called thick skin. And there's just an extra layer of skin there. So it makes our palms and the soles of our feet tougher. So the five layers are the stratum corneum, the stratum lucidum, the stratum granulosum, the stratum spinosum, and the stratum basale or germinativum. Now the stratum basale, as I said before, is that deepest mitotic layer. So those are the cells that are actively dividing. And then they get pushed up into the stratum spinosum and they get kind of spiny in appearance. And then they get pushed up further into the stratum granulosum and now they start to look grainy because all of the organelles and everything are starting to actually disintegrate. They're losing that nourishment so they can't stay alive anymore. Then you have the stratum lucidum, which is only present in thick skin. So on the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet. And then the outermost layer is a stratum corneum, which is just dead keratinized cells that are gonna shed off on a daily basis. As far as functions of the epidermis go, 
It protects against water loss and harmful chemicals, protects us against mechanical injury because it's stratified. So if we scratch it lightly, just the dead skin comes off. We don't really get hurt. So it's a brace, subject to abrasion, basically. So we can lose some skin and we're still fine. And then, of course, to keep out pathogens. This is just a chart showing you the different layers of the skin, their location, and the characteristics of the cells. So as I said, they go from the stratum basale up to the stratum corneum. And as they're moving up, they're starting to die. They're starting to lose their organelles, their nuclei, and starting to basically degenerate. Melanocytes now are the cells in the stratum basale that produce the pigment melanin. Melanin is what gives us our color. Melanin will actually absorb UV light from the sunlight and make us temporarily darker in what we call getting a tan. So what happens is we go out in the sun and that UV light activates the melanocytes. When they're activated, they produce more melanin. When you go out of the sunlight, the melanocyte activity returns back to normal and you get your normal coloring back. Now, melanin is distributed into keratinocytes to protect the cells from damaging UV light. UV light can actually damage our DNA and fibroblasts that make the fibers. It can lead to skin cancer, unfortunately. So that's why they say you need to make sure you wear sunscreen when you go outside. Now, an interesting fact is that all people actually have the same number of melanocytes. So everybody on the planet has the same number of melanocytes, but it's the activity of the melanocytes that determines your skin color. More activity means a darker skin color. That is under genetic control. So the amount of melanin that is produced is what makes everybody different. It's gonna vary in the distribution and the size of the melanin granules. And albinos actually inherit a mutation in melanin genes so that they lack melanin completely. Environmentally speaking, sunlight, of course, is going to affect your skin color by activating the melanocytes and making you darker. UV light from sun lamps has the same effect. And x-rays, unfortunately, can damage our DNA and lead to a lot of problems as well. Physiologically speaking, oxygenation of the blood in the dermal blood vessels can determine the skin color. If we have a lot of blood reaching our blood vessels, then we'll have a pinkish hue to us. If we don't have any oxygen reaching our skin, we'll have cyanosis, which is a bluish color. So your skin color can actually tell you a lot about what's going on with your health. If you're really pink, that means you have too much oxygen getting to your skin. If you're blue, you don't have enough oxygen getting to your skin. And if you're pale, it's called pallor, that can also indicate that you have some sort of infection going on. Vasodilation and vasoconstriction of the dermal blood vessels is gonna impact your skin color. So if they're dilated, they're opened up and a lot of blood is flowing to your skin, or if they're constricted and they're closed so you don't get a lot of blood to your skin. Accumulation of carotene pigment from your diet can actually give you an orangish hue. And jaundice, if you have any issues with your liver, can give you a yellow hue. So indoor tanning and skin cancer, there's been a lot of studies done on this. And exposure to sunlight or a tanning bed actually causes melanocytes to produce more melanin and your skin darkens, as I said. Tanning beds use doses of UV radiation that can actually overwhelm your body's natural protective responses against skin cancer. So tanning beds can actually lead to skin cancer more easily than just being out in the sun can. Basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma arise from the epithelial cells in the skin. Melanomas arise from the melanocytes. And melanomas are the least common skin cancers. However, they cause 80% of cancer deaths because they're so much more dangerous. The dermis is the inner layer of skin. 
It contains dermal papillae between the epidermal ridges, and that's what's actually responsible for your fingerprints. It binds the epidermis to the underlying tissues. It's made of connective tissue and has muscle fibers as well. Every hair on your arms has a little muscle attached to it called an erector pili muscle. And that muscle contracts and raises your hair up when you have goosebumps. The dermal blood vessels, again, supply nutrients to all the skin cells. And there are nerve cell processes, so we have feeling in our skin. Hair follicles, sweat, and sebaceous glands are located in the dermis. And sensory receptors called piscinian corpuscles are deep down in the dermis for pressure. And then we have Meissner's corpuscles for light touch in our dermis as well. The dermis itself consists of two layers, the papillary layer and the reticular layer. The papillary layer is the superficial layer. It's areolar connective tissue and it's thinner. And this is where the dermal papillae are, so your fingerprints. The reticular layer is the deeper layer and that's dense irregular connective tissue and it's the thicker of the two layers. Accessory structures originate from the epidermis and then extend into either the dermis or the hypodermis. So the hair follicles, the nails, and the skin glands, both sweat and sebaceous glands. If the accessory structures remain intact, injured or burned dermis can actually regenerate. If the accessory stu structures do not remain intact, however, that's where skin grafts and things have to come into play. So the nails are the protective coverings on the ends of our fingers and toes. There are three parts to a nail. The nail plate overlies the nail bed. The nail bed is the surface of the skin underneath the nail plate. And the lunula is the most active growing region. It's pale, it's a half moon shaped region at the base of the nail plate. So if you look at your finger nails, you have the nail plate is what you can see. The lunula is all the way at the bottom and people's lunulas differ in sizes. But that's where your nail is actively growing. And then the free edge is just what hangs over the actual skin itself. And then the nail bed is underneath the nail plate. So if you tear off your fingernail, for example, that's when the nail bed becomes exposed and it's very painful. Hair is present on all surfaces of the skin except for the palms, the soles of our feet, the lips, nipples, and parts of the external reproductive organs. So a hair follicle is a tube-like depression of epidermal cells and the hair develops out of that. It extends into the dermis or even the subcutaneous layer depending. There are three parts of the hair. The hair bulb are the dividing cells the hair root, and then the hair shaft, which are actually dead epidermal cells. Hair papillae actually contain blood vessels which are going to surround it and nourish the hair. Our hair color is due to the type and the amount of melanin that's deposited into the hair follicles. And as I said earlier, the erector pili muscle is what will raise your hair up when you get goosebumps. So the most common type of baldness is pattern baldness. On the top of the head is where you lose your hair. This is called androgenic alopecia. It's often associated with lowered levels of testosterone in men and estrogen in women. Progenitor cells are lacking in the bald spots, but stem cells are present. Alopecia areata is when the body produces antibodies that actually attack the hair follicles so this is known as an autoimmune hair loss. So hair loss is unfortunately a common occurrence in individuals, and sometimes it can be your own immune system attacking it. Sebaceous glands are holocrine glands. These are usually associated with hair follicles. They produce what is called sebum, which is a fatty material in cellular debris. Sebum is what keeps the hair and skin soft and waterproof though. Excess sebum, however, can result in acne, so it's not something that's you want enough of it to stay soft and waterproof, but you don't want too much to cause acne. Again, these are absent on the palms and the soles. Acne vulgaris is a disorder of the sebaceous glands, very common at puberty because what happens is the androgen release at puberty puts the sebaceous glands in high gear, basically. 
So they become clogged with all of the extra sebum that they're producing and the epithelial cells and trigger acne to develop. The clogged glands provide a perfect environment for anaerobic bacteria and infection is going to result in the inflammation and acne is the end result of that. It affects about 80% of people between the ages of 11 and 30. It's treated best with vitamin A derivatives, systemic antibiotics, salicylic acid, or benzoyl peroxide. And treatments aren't going to be the same for everybody, and each treatment will work differently on different individuals. Sweat glands are also called sudoriferous glands. These are very widespread in the skin. They originate deeper down in the dermis or even the hypodermis, and they're ball-shaped coils. Now, there are two types, eccrine and apocrine. Eccrine glands are merocrine glands, and these are the most numerous. These are the ones that help regulate body temperature. Apocrine sweat glands are in the axillary and groin areas, and they secrete their products by exocytosis. These respond to emotions and pain. These are not activated until we hit puberty. So these are the ones responsible for body odor. So to remember the difference between apocrine and eccrine glands, what I did was I thought of boys when they hit puberty, they kind of turn into apes and apocrine ape, they're activated at puberty. I mean, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, sorry, but that's how I remembered it. Eccrine glands are functional at birth. Apocrine glands are functional at puberty. Ceruminous glands secrete earwax and mammary glands secrete milk. So here's a chart summarizing the different types of glands, their function, their description, and location. So the skin is very versatile, but it's very vital for homeostasis to be maintained. It helps excrete some waste, but also produces vitamin D in an inactive form. Vitamin D is necessary for calcium absorption. So we need that skin to produce that inactivated vitamin D, which will then go to the liver to be activated, and then we can use it. It also helps regulate body temperature, has a lot of sensory receptors, prevents some water loss, and very importantly, is a protective covering and is our first line of defense against anything harmful. It's very important to regulate our body temperature because a slight shift can disrupt the rates of metabolic reactions. We know that increase in temperature increases the rate of reactions, decrease in temperature decreases the rate of reactions. So the set point is monitored by the hypothalamus. Deep body temperature stays close to 37 degrees Celsius or about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit but we know that there's a couple degrees in either direction and you're still okay. You don't run to the hospital if your temperature is 97.6 and you don't run to the hospital if your fever is 100. So within a few degrees is okay. But the skin plays a key role in regulating our body temperature because of all of the sensory receptors and thermal receptors we have in our skin. Heat is a product of cellular metabolism. Nothing is 100% efficient. All reactions lose some energy as heat. The most active body cells are going to be major heat producers, so the skeletal muscle, the cardiac muscle, and the liver. If the body is too warm, the body is going to respond with vasodilation of the dermal blood cells and vasoconstriction of the deep blood vessels so that heat can get through the skin. There are four primary methods or four methods of heat loss. Radiation is the primary method, and this is when the infrared heat rays escape. We also have conduction, where the heat moves from the skin to cooler objects. There's convection, which is heat loss into the circulating air currents, and then evaporation. Sweat will change into a gas and carry the heat away. But radiation is that primary method of heat loss. So when the body temperature rises, thermal receptors are going to signal the hypothalamus, the blood vessels will be vasodilated and the sweat glands will be activated. On the other hand, when the body temperature falls, again, the thermal receptors are going to signal the hypothalamus, the blood vessels will be vasoconstricted, the sweat glands will be inactivated, 
and the muscles will contract involuntarily to cause shivering, which will generate body heat. So negative feedback. Problems can occur though. Hyperthermia is an abnormally high body temperature. This can occur if it's very hot and humid and we can't sweat enough. If the air temperature is high, radiation is gonna be less effective. So the body actually gains heat from the hotter air. The skin can become dry, a person can get nauseous, dizzy, a headache, or pulse can speed up, a person can get really weak. On the other side, hypothermia is abnormally low body temperature. This can result from exposure to cold or illness. Shivering is going to occur because our skeletal muscles are gonna involuntarily contract, trying to generate heat because the hypothalamus tells them to. If it continues, you can get confused and lethargic. You can start to lose reflexes and eventually consciousness. Without treatment, our organs will shut down. So it's very important if you are going through hyperthermia to cool your body down quickly, which is one reason why they will put you in an ice bath often. And if you're experiencing hypothermia to get your body temperature elevated, so blankets and warming blankets are often used. Sometimes they will have to go as far as to inject warming fluid into the person if they are too cold. So the loss of the ability of the homeostatic temperature control mechanism to function in an extremely hot environment is going to be a big problem. If you have exposure to very high heat, it can overwhelm our temperature control mechanisms and lead to hyperthermia. If the body builds up heat faster than the heat can be lost, the body temperature is going to rise even if the set point is normal because you're building up fat heat faster than you can get rid of it. Extreme vasodilation can collapse the cardiovascular system and can actually be fatal. We have a set point where our body temperature is supposed to stay. If we have a fever, that set point is elevated by the immune system to fight infection. Oftentimes, if we have an invader, our body knows that a lot of invaders do not like an increase in body temperature. So we will raise our body temperature on purpose to try to fight that off. Phagocytes will release pyrogens in response to a presence of a virus or bacteria so that the hypothalamus will then increase that set point and raise the body temperature. This fever or elevated body temperature will hopefully destroy the pathogens and then you can go back to normal. Inflammation is a normal response to injury or stress. Four signs of inflammation, redness, swelling, warmth, and pain. It's basically our body's attempt to restrict the spread of infection. So the blood vessels in the affected tissues are going to dilate and become more permeable so that fluids can actually leak into the damaged tissues. And like I said, what our body's trying to do is cut off that area so that we can heal it and it doesn't spread. A shallow cut only affects the epidermis and basically it just results in epidermal cells along its margin to divide more rapidly than usual and they'll fill in the gap. A deep cut reaches the dermis or the subcutaneous layer and this results in blood vessels breaking. Released blood is gonna form a clot. So that's how you know how deep your cut is. If you cut yourself and you don't bleed, you're only in the epidermis. Because remember, the epidermis doesn't have blood vessel innervation. If you cut yourself and you're bleeding, you know you've got down to the dermis. So a blood clot consists of fibrin, blood cells, and platelets. What will happen is the clot will dry out, the tissue fluid will dry out, and it's gonna form a scab. Epithelial cells will then reproduce to fill in that wound. Fibroblasts will secrete collagen fibers and they will wind together. And then growth factors will stimulate new tissue formation. Finally, phagocytic cells will come in and remove all of the debris and dead cells and the scab will slough off. Excess collagen fibers may form what's called a scar though. And if you pick your scab off, you will definitely have a scar. So don't pick your scabs. Scabs naturally fall off when they are ready to fall off.
So here's a picture of how a wound heals. So you have the initial wound and then you have the blood clot form. The blood clot is going to combine with the blood cells and platelets and everything else and eventually form a scab. Underneath the scab, their epidermis is regenerating and then the scab will fall off. Burns are classified by the extent of tissue damage. Superficial or first degree burns injures only the epidermis. So a sunburn, for example, would be a superficial first degree burn. Redness, heat, and inflammation are also characterizations. Healing usually takes days to weeks, then you don't have a scar. Second degree burns, you have a deep burn and a partial thickness. It destroys the epidermis and some of the dermis. So if you get a burn from a hot liquid, for example, these may blister and healing is going to depend on the severity of the burn cells and how the stem cells have survived. So the stem cells and the hair follicles and glands can also help regenerate skin. Secondary burns usually recover completely with no scarring. So if you burn yourself on the stove, for example, and it blisters up, oftentimes the blister goes away and you can't even tell you were burned. Third degree burns, however, the full thickness of the dermis is destroyed. So the epidermis, the dermis, and the accessory structures are all destroyed. This can result from prolonged exposure to flame, hot liquid, or heat. There are some healing at the margins of the burn, but these are often going to require skin grafts and skin substitutes. Usually it is almost a black color or a cherry red. And oftentimes the ironic thing is that it doesn't hurt because everything was destroyed. The epidermis was destroyed, the dermis was destroyed, and all of the accessory structures and nerve endings were destroyed. The problem is that the healing process is very painful because as our skin starts to heal and they have to constantly debride the wounds and get rid of all of that dead skin, that is very painful. Treatment of burns involves estimating the extent of the injured body surface using the rule of nines. It basically divides the body surface into regions or 9%, multiples of nine basically. From that estimate, we can make a plan to replace fluids and electrolytes and the skin that needs to be replaced can be figured out. So as we grow old, we know that our body changes. The cell cycle slows down, our skin will start to become scaly, age spots start to appear, the epidermis and dermis become thinner, and that subcutaneous layer actually starts to be lost. So people start to feel cold as they get older. So when grandma says she's cold, grandma's really cold, get her a blanket. Wrinkling occurs, our skin starts to sag, our skin becomes drier because our sebaceous glands aren't secreting as much oil as they used to. Melanin production slows, so our hair will start to whiten because we won't have that melanin deposit anymore. Our hair will start to thin out. The number of hair follicles decreases. Our nail growth becomes impaired. Sensory receptors decline. Body temperature regulation is harder to do and we have a diminished ability to produce vitamin D, especially in women. So oftentimes if you are given a supplement, maybe you need a calcium supplement, it has to have vitamin D in it as well because we need vitamin D to absorb calcium. So while all of these things sound horrible and getting older, you know, for lack of better terminology sucks, as I've said before, we have to remember that at least we get to experience getting older and we get to experience these things because not everybody gets to. So at the end of every chapter, I'll kind of be talking about what happens to that system as we age. And it's never going to be good, but it's life and it's part of life. And we have to remember that at least we get to live it. So that is all for now. I will talk to you next time. Bye.